Hello and welcome. In the last class, we had seen three divisions of the Earth. The lithosphere, hydrosphere and atmosphere. The lithosphere is made up of crust, core and mantle. The crust is made up of rocks. The study of rocks is called petrology. Petro means rock, logy means to study. Now, by the study of rocks, we can have an idea of evolution of life on Earth. Rock is an agglomeration of minerals and earthly particles like clay, sand, shale and magma. There are three types of rocks, igneous, metamorphic and sedimentary. Igneous rocks are made, made up from magma or molten rocks and as they cool, they form rocks. There are two types of igneous rocks, one is extrusive and the other is intrusive. Extrusive rocks are formed on the surface of the earth from lava, which is magma, that has emerged from underground. Intrusive rocks are formed from magma that cools and solidifies within the surface of the crust. Examples of igneous rock are granite, basalt, gabbro, etc. Sedimentary rocks are formed from pre-existing rocks or pieces of once living organism. They form from deposits that accumulate on the earth's surface. Sedimentary rocks have often distinctive layers or bedding. Common sedimentary rocks include sandstone, limestone and shale. The third category of rocks are the metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks are made from igneous and sedimentary rocks by the process of metamorphism or through the action of heat and high pressure. Examples of metamorphic rocks are phyllite, schist, gneiss, quartzite and marble. Rocks are made up of minerals. For example, in this picture you can see that granite is made up of quartz, felsal and biotite. Now then what then is a mineral? A mineral is a naturally occurring inorganic substance formed under favorable conditions, having a definite chemical composition, crystalline form and ordered atomic arrangement. Although more than 5300 minerals are known, but only a few occur on the Earth's surface. And to your surprise, you will be uh, amazed to know that more of the more than 90% of the minerals are silicates. Minerals are classified as primary or secondary based on when and how they are formed. Primary minerals are formed when magma cools and solidifies, whereas secondary minerals are formed by chemical or physical reactions within a rocks, so they are formed later on. They are formed by weathering, diagenesis, or by low temperature alteration of a pre existing rock. For example, mica is a primary mineral that alters to form elite, a secondary mineral. Primary minerals can further be classified as ferromagnesian and non ferromagnesian. Ferro means iron, magnesium means magnesium. Magnesium. Ferromagnesium minerals could be ortho, neso, soro, etc. silicates, whereas non ferromagnesian are tectosilicates. Secondary minerals could be silicates and non silicates. Silicate minerals are predominantly clays, and non silicate minerals are oxides, hydroxides, carbonates, sulfates, and phosphates. If you look at the abundance of the elements of the Earth's crust, out of the 118 elements known to us, 8 are sufficiently abundant to constitute 98.6% by weight of the Earth's crust. They include oxygen, silicon, aluminium, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium. These elements combine to form minerals that gives rise to rocks. The converse is also true. You can see that oxygen and silicon together make up three-fourths of the Earth's crust. And it is no wonder that they constitute more than 90% of the minerals on the Earth's crust. Now, soil has three particle size fractions, sand, silt and clay. Sand being coarser and clay being finer. Now, if we try to search which mineral resides in which size fraction of the soil, we will find that the primary minerals reside in the sand and silt fraction of the soil, whereas the secondary minerals predominantly reside in the clay fraction of the soil. This is nicely depicted in this graph. We then come finally to what then is soil. Soil is a three-phase system, solid, liquid and gaseous. The solid phase can be further classified as inorganic and organic. The inorganic phase consists of sand, silt and clay, whereas the organic fraction consists of humus. Humus is further divided into humic acid, fulvic acid and humic, whereas the inorganic fraction, sand, silt and clay, is where the primary and secondary minerals resides. When we try to define soil, the first thing that comes to our mind is soil 
as the natural medium for plant growth. Dokuche, who is also known as the father of soil science, defines soil as a natural body, each with a unique morphology resulting from a unique combination of climate, living matter, earth parent materials, relief and age of landform. The morphology of each soil as expressed by vertical sections through the different horizons reflects the combined effect of particular set of genetic factors responsible for its development. However, the latest definition of soil says that soil is a natural body comprising of solid, liquid and gaseous that occurs on the land surface, occupies space and is characterized by one or both of the following. Number one, horizon or layers that are distinguishable from the initial material as a result of addition, losses, transfers and transformation of energy and matter or number two, ability to support rooted plants in a natural environment. However, the definition given by Joffe is simple to understand and remember. Soil is a three-dimensional natural body consisting of solid liquid gaseous phases differentiated into different horizons whose physical, chemical and biological properties are so different from the parent material view. This definition differs from the modern definition in that this definition does not take into account soil's ability to support rooted plants. Let us now refresh our mind about what a colloid is. The colloid state is the state of subdivision in which molecules or polymolecular particles have at least one dimension in the range of one nanometer and one micrometer and are dispersed in some medium. Soil fits into this definition of colloid and hence we have soil colloids. There are four soil colloids, layer silicate clays, iron and aluminum oxides and hydroxoxides, allophane and hemoglite, and humus. It will not be wrong to say that the sand size fraction which is predominant by quartz gives the skeleton to the soil, whereas the clay size fraction is home to the soil colloids. Reactivity of soil colloids is because of its charge and surface area. The first colloidal soil fraction is the layer silicate clays. They are the most stable and persistent silicates which occur as weathering products in the clay fraction of soils and are called sheet silicates. They differ on the basis of number and sequence of tetrahedral and octahedral sheets, layer charge per unit cell structure, type of interlayer bond and cation, cations in octahedral sheet and type of stacking in the C direction. The layer silicate clays can be further classified into 1 is to 1, 2 is to 1 and 2 is to 1 is to 1 type. The 1 is to 1 also known as the kaolinite serpentine group consists of kaolinite, halocyte, serpentine and chrysolite. The 2 is to 1 group has further subdivided into pyrophyllite tail group, smectite saponite group, vermiculite group and mica group. The pyrophyllite tail group has pyrophyllite and talc as end members. The smectite saponite group has mortomponite, bidelite, nortonite as members. The vermiculite group has vermiculite as member. And the micra group has muscovite and biotite as members. The twist to one is to one group has also known as chlorite, has pseudorite and clinclor as their members. The second group of soil colloid is known as the hydrous oxides of iron and aluminium. They are universal constituents of soil clay fraction and are predominant in the tropics and the subtropics. The oxides include oxyhydroxides OOH and hydroxides OH of iron, aluminium and manganese. They are structurally simpler than layer silicates and has Fe3+, Al3+, Mn4+, or Mn3+, in the octahedral sites. Example, Gothite hematite, magnetite, gypsite, and diaspora. The oxides do not develop charge by isomorphous substitution, so have low cation exchange capacity, but may have large surface area, which give them reactivity in soil. The third category of soil colloid is the non-crystalline minerals. They are observed in soils developed on volcanic ash and glacial fields and are poorly crystallized aluminium silicates or oxide 
minerals. Examples are allofin, immobilite, and ferrihydrite. Allofin is characterized by no structural order, that is why they are non crystalline. They are hydrous aluminosilicate found in tropics formed by intensive weathering of basic igneous rocks. They do not possess permanent charge but have pH dependent charge. Immobilite is like allofin but have higher degree of order in its structure. Ferrihydrite is non-crystalline oxide. The fourth component of soil colloid is soil organic matter. Soil organic matter is a transformed product known as humus by the process of humification which forms amorphous polymers like humic acid, fulvic acid and humin. Nearly 70 to 80 percent of soil organic matter is humic substances. Now let us examine the components that give reactivity to the soil. Number one, charge. Number two, surface area. Charge is of two types, permanent or variable. Surface area is of two types, internal and external. As the name indicates, the permanent charge is due to isomorphous substitution and hence it is permanent. It, is, it happens when Isomorphic substitution of one ion takes place for another inside the crystal lattice. The substituting ion may be greater than equal to or less than the charge than the ion it substitutes. If the lower valency substitutes for higher valency, then negative charge develops. For example, if magnesium substitutes for aluminium or aluminium substitutes for silicon, then negative charge develops. This happens during crystallization of layer silicates and is the principal source of negative charge for twist to one and twist to one is to one type of minerals but of minor importance for one is to one type of minerals this does not change and is called permanent this gives rise to cation exchange capacity second type of charge is the variable or ph dependent charge the positive charge developed at low ph and the excessive negative charge developed at high ph is collectively known as the ph dependent charge example allofin Hydrous oxides and kaolinite develop pH dependent charge at low pH. The source of pH dependent charge is gain or loss of hydrogen ions from the functional groups on the surface of the soil colloid. Look at this diagram. In the center, you will find that no charge has developed. This is point the zero. This is called the zero point of charge. At higher pH, when there is excess of OH, then the negative charge develops. Whereas at lower pH on the left where there is excess H+, plus, then positive charge develops. Surface area may be external or internal. It is expressed as meter square per gram. Large surface area is associated with swelling, shrinkage, viscosity, sedimentation in water, large adsorption capacity and hence reactivity. The below table shows the minerals, whether they have an internal or external surface area, the total surface area and the cation exchange capacity. As you can see that kaolinite has only external surface area and so the low CEC also. Elite which has external surface areas whereas montanolite has internal as well as external surface area. So does vermiculite has internal as, as well as external surface area. The total surface area in vermiculite and montanolite is much much more than for elite, kaolinite or chloride. Hence, these are components of reactivity. So, in this presentation, we started with the mighty rocks and came down to the tiny colloidal particles of the soil and discussed what makes them reactive, charge and surface area.